on this episode of China Uncensored. Guys, it's supposed to be a silent invasion. Hi, welcome to China Uncensored. I'm your host, Chris Chappell. It's one of the most controversial books of the year, Silent Invasion by Professor Clive Hamilton. It details how the Chinese Communist Party is infiltrating Australian society and politics. I sat down with Professor Hamilton to discuss why he refuses to be silent about this invasion. Thank you for joining us today, Professor Hamilton. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. Uh, so in Silent Invasion, you talk about uh, <clears throat> dark money, uh, spies, and gullible politicians. Which should we be most terrified of? Well, it's a constellation. I'm sorry, I wish I could pick out one, but this is the thing about uh, the CCP's influence operations in Australia. As one intelligence official described it to me, he called it a full court press. I'm sure your American listeners will understand that basketball term. I had to look it up. It means an all-out offensive. And so what I described in my book is the, uh, a whole series of operations whereby the CCP and its agents of influence uh, in Australia and from China have attempted to influence, at times with great success, all of Australia's major institutions, from politics uh, to media uh, to business uh, and, of course, into universities. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate the basketball reference. It sounds like the Communist Party really scored a touchdown. Um, <laughs> So, was there any, when you were doing the research for the book, was there anything that surprised you? I was constantly surprised. Nothing is sacred. No area of Australian society, politics, or culture um, is free from influence if there's an opportunity there. And so, uh, as you say, that was one of the shocking elements that I came across the way in which, and I don't want to exaggerate this, my understanding is this has only happened in a small way so far, but the way in which uh, agents of the CCP have made themselves present in the congregations of Chinese Christian churches in Australia. And of course, the CCP is officially an atheist organisation, um, and so uh, the infiltration is certainly not because uh, the CCP feels as though it needs to inject a spiritual element into its ideology. Mm -hmm. Is the Communist Party's infiltration targeting any particular political party? Uh, they're quite um, eclectic in their political tastes. They'll infiltrate anything that they can. What impact do you hope Silent Invasion will have? I wrote the book in order to wake up Australians as to what is happening. Uh, to give them a full picture of the nature of these operations and more particularly why. Why is the CCP targeting Australia in this way? So really it's to bring about social change, political change in response to what I see, as many others do, uh, as a really big problem in Australia. How does this affect your average Australian who might be more concerned about rugby or Vegemite or whatever the average Australian is into these days? When I've been going around the country giving talks, uh, chatting to people about the book, is that it seems to me that a very large number of Australians had a kind of sense that there was something wrong, that they'd picked up something in the newspapers or in their local community about some kind of um, uh, intrusion uh, from the CCP or a major Chinese corporation that worried them. There's a kind of unease about what's been happening and, and therefore many Chinese Australians, sorry, many non-Chinese Australians uh, and a lot of Chinese Australians have seized upon the book uh, as a way of explaining more broadly what has been happening, this kind of niggling sense that they've had that there's something odd going on that that's made them feel uneasy. So. And what was your reaction when your publisher told you they weren't going to si uh, they weren't going to publish Silent Invasion? Uh, were you like, "Wow, I wish I had included that story in my book"? I was shocked. I was deeply shocked. Uh, Alan and Anwen, I've worked with for many, many years, they have been extremely enthusiastic about the book uh, right up to the day before 
I got the phone call and said, we're pulling the plug. And they said subsequently that, um, and the phone call and in writing subsequently, that they did it because they were afraid of retaliation from Beijing. And I thought, it's a kind of brilliant but unwelcome vindication of the essential argument of my book. Yeah, so it really worked out for you. Well, at one level, it certainly drew a huge amount of publicity to the book and suddenly the publication of my book became a free speech issue. Mind you, it's not a pleasant thing uh, to spend uh, weeks and weeks feeling uh, with good reason that the uh, state security apparatus uh, in Beijing is keeping a very close eye on you. I mean, am I at any risk being here with you right now? Well, we did have a spy sitting outside of this building uh, who uh, was carrying with her what uh, I was subsequently told was probably a sniffer, which is a device that looked like a mobile phone, but in fact is a quite sophisticated electronic device that can pick up all Wi-Fi and mobile telephone communication inside a building. That sounds fun to be getting that kind of attention. Well, it does unsettle one and uh, after a while you do start to take notice of things around you that normally you wouldn't bother about. Um, there's no doubt, uh, based on advice and uh, from security experts and the Australian Federal Police, that the uh, Chinese authorities in Australia are collecting a dossier on me. I've been the subject of uh, cyber intrusions. I've been uh, subjected to a really intense campaign of, uh, of uh, uh, vilification and bullying. Were you surprised by the controversy the book generated? You know, I anticipated it, but in the abstract. You know, mm. you anticipate something, I think this is going to be very controversial. I think I'm going to be accused of racism and anti-China xenophobia. But when it actually happened, it kind of comes on you with, a, with an intensity and emotional oomph that uh, is really quite uh, hard to take. I mean, you ha need to have the skin of a rhino to, uh, to not want to crawl into a hole and, uh, and stay there. Um, the Chinese embassy has called critics of China filled with co a Cold War mentality and anti-China hysteria and paranoia. Which of those best describes you? Well, you know, I grew up in the Cold War, so maybe some of it's still hanging around me uh, somewhere. But, you know, the key point, I'm sure, which many of your listeners understand, is that whenever there's any criticism of the Communist Party, the Communist Party propaganda efforts work very hard to persuade the public that, in fact, it's the Chinese people who are under attack. It's the only way it can really defend itself from these kinds of criticism. Is racism a real potential problem? On the question of whether the book uh, will stimulate uh, racist elements in our society, anti-China feeling, that was my concern from day one. I took every measure I could as I researched and wrote the book to avoid the possibility that the book could lend any credibility to those anti-China racist sentiments on the fringe of our society. I consulted with people in the Chinese Australian community and reflected their views in the book. And uh, I think I do that quite effectively. So you really have to, do, you really have to work quite hard uh, to draw out of the book anything that can be used uh, to defend the idea that the book is racist or stimulates racism. Some people have worked very hard at drawing that conclusion from the book. Um, some of them have been quite surprised. Uh, that pe some people, I thought, why, why are you doing that? Um, so one of the fascinating things that I've learnt in the last four weeks is how deeply entrenched in some segments of the political left is the idea that um, any criticism of the Communist Party is a criticism of Chinese people and therefore we must uh, defend this oppressed minority. Give me a break. I mean, Chinese Australians that I spoke to, many of them don't feel that way. You, should, you, defenders of multiculturalism, should go and talk to them rather than community leaders who uh, actually represent United Front organisations that dance to the Communist Party's tune. 
but you actually have a lot of connections in the Chinese Australian community. What was their reaction to your book? Well, they, they welcomed it when I uh, made contact with them initially and started to talk to them. Um, we found uh, last week that a group of Chinese Australians was very, very eager to have a launch in Sydney for the book. And I was really blown away but about, by the number of Chinese Australians that packed into that room at uh, Parliament House in Sydney and gave the book such an extraordinarily enthusiastic uh, launch uh, off into the world. Why do you think that was? Well, I think that uh, for the last 10 to 20 years, many Chinese Australians who are critical of the Communist Party and say, we came to Australia to escape the clutches from the Communist Party and now they're following us here, their voices have been silenced, they've been marginalised, they've been kicked out of the public debate and uh, the mainstream media and politicians have been talking to community leaders which are, who generally run United Front organisations. So many Chinese Australians have been extremely grateful that finally someone in the mainstream has been taking their complaints seriously and has written a book about it. And most important question, how does this affect America? Well, it has a huge uh, implication for the United States and, and that is because the authorities in the United States from uh, a Congress uh, to the CIA, FBI, to think tanks inside the Beltway that take notice of China, to a whole lot of scholars across the country are watching very, very closely what is happening in the Australian Parliament uh, to the debate that we've been discussing today with a view to copying the ways in which Australian governments and, the, and Australian society more broadly pushes back against Beijing's attempts to interfere with, influence, guide and ultimately control what happens in this country. So in your book it says the Communist Party is using democracy to destroy democracy. What can liberal democracies do to protect ourselves and our freedoms? Well, I think liberal democracies need to muscle up. I mean, here is a serious threat to the f foundational values of uh, liberal democracy led by very uh, powerful economic incentives coming from the People's Republic of China. And I think we in the liberal democracies need to make a really fundamental decision, one that we haven't been forced to do I'm about to say ever, but certainly for many decades, and that is to decide how much is our freedom worth. All right, thank you very much for joining me today, Professor Hamilton. I've enjoyed it. And I would highly recommend picking up a copy of Silent Invasion. I've read it myself, and you can find a link to how you can purchase it in the description below. China Uncensored is supported by viewers like you. Our trip here to Australia was not funded by the CIA or Taiwan, but by our amazing supporters on Patreon. Click here to visit our website on patreon.com to see how you can contribute to the show.